What's up, y'all? It's your man, Stephen Bartle, coming back at you with another edition of Bartle's Breakdown. I'm your host, and I've got a special guest on today, Nick Bob, from so many different hats. He's got his own podcast. He was a hooper in college at, at uh, Kansas and Creighton. Um, he's a, a one of my colleagues. He calls games on Big Ten Network, Fox Sports. Um, you might be Jamaican, Nick. What's going on, man? How you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> basketball has a way of bonding that's right it, you know it, you, it doesn't matter that we weren't in the same locker room we're all in one big locker room when it comes to basketball and his family so I appreciate you having me on no I appreciate you coming on man I, I think you've got a, a really good story and I like what you're doing currently on the side of your podcast and we'll get to that but I don't think Nick a lot of people know that uh you're hoop prowess like you were a baller um, can you talk about when you were first exposed to the game? You know, honestly, for as long as I can remember, I was in love with basketball. You know, it was the thing that I, I wanted to do from when I was kindergarten, grade school. That was my thing, you know, and I'm sure your story is very similar. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in football country in Nebraska, but coaching in basketball is in the ball family tree. My Grandpa was a high school basketball coach. My uncle's a high school basketball coach. My older brother's a high, a high school basketball coach. Wow. So a lot of the Thanksgiving and Christmas conversations centered around basketball. Mm -hmm. And so I immediately fell in love with the game at a young age. And one of my favorite things to do growing up, put, put the mini hoop up on the, on, you know, on the, on the back of the, the door of the closet. And I would get the, Michael Jordan come fly with me, Michael Jordan's playground, Michael Jordan's airtime, and I'd watch those and, you know, hoop around in my, in my basement. And, and honestly, I think that's where the love for the game really sparked, just kind of the, the imaginary games you play with yourself in, in your basement, in the front uh, driveway. Uh, so from a young age, that was what I, what I aspired to be. Everything I did was centered around, like, how can I become a better basketball player? And that just kind of stuck with me all the way through, uh, obviously, grade school, uh, middle school, high school, and then on into college. Uh, so it was, yeah, I, I've been madly in love with the game for forever. So, Nick, you must have been pretty damn good, my man, because uh, not a lot of people get offers in Kansas. I mean, we're, when in high school, where were you thinking about going? What were, like, your top three or five schools? Yeah, I had a weird recruiting experience, Stephen, like, Honestly, it was Kansas, and then it was a bunch of mid-major schools. It was really? like Bowling Green, Ohio, Boise State, Creighton. So it, it was kind of weird how, you know, you have, uh, I mean, Roy Williams, because what people, I was recruited by Roy Williams, and I had committed to play for Roy and right when Roy was going to North Carolina. And so I remember, I'll never forget, when I was, uh, it would have been April of 2003, I'm driving home from high school and I get into my, my kitchen and I see the news, Roy Williams to Carolina. And I'm like, oh man, you know, what am I gonna do now? Right. Does Bill, Bill Self, I don't, I don't know Bill Self, Bill Self doesn't know me, what's gonna happen? And so ultimately I ended up, Kansas was my dream school always. You know, I mean, the first time, I don't know if you've been, have you been to Allen Fieldhouse? Oh yeah, plenty of times. Man. The, the very first recruiting visit I went there, I was sold after the jump ball. You know what I mean? I was like, this is unbelievable. You know, like, yeah. I have a chance to play here. And so I was kind of torn where it was like, once Roy Williams left, it was still my dream school. So here comes Coach Self. And he, I have a sit down with him. And, you know, we have a, a good conversation. And the, to, to make sure people understand, I, was a, I ended up being a preferred walk-on. Mm -hmm. So I was recruited by, by, by Roy, and he was always uh, very straightforward with, with kind of how he saw me and, and where I'd fit in. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was weird where no school recruited me harder than Kansas, mm -hmm. even though I had offers from Boise State and Bowling Green and Ohio and all these different mid-major schools. Um, it, it, was, it, it was an interesting kind of scenario where you wouldn't think that the Blue Blood school – recruit some mid-major guy harder than than everybody else and uh you know I was a I was just a, I was a, a high IQ player that could shoot the ball um you know I was kind of like a a hybrid between Heinrich and Boshi but mm. not as athletic as Kirk Heinrich 
Okay. Uh, just, just one of those kind of guys that space the floor, don't turn the ball over. Um, and so, yeah, would, I, I felt like I would have fit in Roy Williams' system well, but ultimately that didn't happen. But I'm glad that I stuck, stuck with it. And even though I had ultimately transferred from KU, it was unbelievable playing for Bill Self and playing for, for Kansas. Yeah, uh, for the listeners and, uh, for the, and the viewers of this, if you guys consider yourselves college basketball fans, the bucket list is Fog Allen. You yes. got to get there because Jaron Howard, the assistant coach at Kansas, he'll post a lot. He says it's just different, and it is. It's, it's, it's a special thing at Kansas. And, uh, you know, I, I was going to give you some love because I'm telling you, I'm a little jealous myself because Kansas is blue blood. And they, yeah. didn't, they, didn't, they didn't recruit me until very, very late in the game. But, you know, but kudos to you on that. So what, what was your decision, Nick, in terms of you, you found yourself in Kansas, you got along with self, but you made a choice to transfer from Kansas to Creighton. Why? why? It honestly just came down to playing time. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, did, I didn't play a ton my freshman and sophomore year. I had maybe a five or six game stretch in conference play where I was Aaron Miles' backup point guard. Um, you know, and, and was kind of in and out of the lineup. And what ended up kind of happening my sophomore year was we were preseason ranked number one in the country. Mm. And heading in through the, the, the fall and preseason, Coach Self was talking about redshirting me. And I played probably the best basketball of my life in that preseason. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a meeting with him, and he said, listen, I, I, you know, if you want a red shirt, I'm, I'm going to support that. But I could see you playing anywhere from five to 15 to 20 minutes a game for us. And I'm like, you know, preseason number one team in the country, talking about any role at all. I'm like, I want to play. Right. And then in, early in the season, Stephen, Wayne Simeon, yep. he, broke his, he broke his wrist and we went to a different offense that we went to like four round one ball screens, penetration. That's not my game. And so I, I, I kind of got slid back to the end of the bench. And then at the, at the end of the year, we were bringing in guys like Brandon Rush and Mario Chalmers. Oh, yeah. and, and I'm like, you know, one of the things I think that's important for basketball players is you got to be confident, but you also got to be able to look in the mirror and be real with yourself. That's right. And I was like, you know, I just don't think I'm as good as Mario Chalmers. I'm not as good as Brandon Rush. I'm not as good as Russell Robinson and some of these other guys. And so – I, I loved KU, but I, I, it, it hit a point where I was like, okay, I can stick, stick it through here. Would I be happy if I never play? Mm. And ultimately, my answer was no. I, I, I wanted to play. So that's where I had, had a relationship with Dana Altman and Creighton because they recruited me out of high school. And, you know, Coach Self helped facilitate all that, even though he was telling me he wanted me to stay. Uh, but ultimately, I, I just – I had to do what gave my – gave myself the best chance to be a consistent contributor. And that's what's so weird. I'm very uh, – that's why people got to be careful about painting transfers with a broad brush. Great like, point. You, you know, like it, not every situation's the same. You know, like, for instance, I don't view Sam and Joey Hauser's situation to transfer like I view my situation. Those guys were starters. Right. They were on a top 15 team, mm -hmm. and they left. You know, I was on the end of the bench and wanted a chance to play. Yeah. And so, and a lot of people think, oh, you must have hated Bill Self. You must have, I was like, no, I love Bill Self. I loved it there. So ultimately that's what it came down to, Steven. I was like, I just, I want a chance to play. And I felt like I had a better chance to play in the Missouri Valley Conference at Creighton than I did at Kansas and in, in the Big 12. So you go from Kansas, you know, top blue blood program, coach self, Hall of Fame coach. Now you go to another in my opinion, Hall of Fame coach and Dana Altman. Dana Altman's an outstanding coach, in my opinion, because obviously, Nick, you know I'm from the Missouri Valley Conference area, grew up in Carbondale, very familiar with the Creighton program. So you leave Kansas and you go to Creighton. Um, what was it like coming back to your home state after going uh, to Kansas? Well, I think one of the things that hurt me, Stephen, and when I look at my career was so I didn't play very much my freshman and sophomore year at Kansas. Okay. And then I have to transfer and you have to sit out a year. Oh, I so see. So all of a sudden, three years had elapsed yep. where I hadn't played. And basketball is a confidence sport and it's a rhythm sport. That's right. And I kind of had lost a little bit of my swag and my confidence and my rhythm. So by the time I became eligible my junior year, I was a 
a little bit more out of sync than I wanted to, than I, than I maybe wanted to admit. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like I can say it now. There was a little bit of, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say I was arrogant, but I thought I was like, man, I was a Kansas, man. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to get all the shots. I'm going to be the guy. And it just didn't, it didn't work out like that. We had a guy named Nate Funk. That oh, was, Nate could play. Nate was awesome, Steven. I know you called a couple of games. Like, yes. he was a really good player. Yes. And, you know, I found out quickly, you mentioned Carbondale. I mean, Southern Illinois in the mid-2000s, outstanding basketball program, great yes. teams. And so I, had, I got humbled a little bit my junior year where, you know, I thought I was going to be the man, and it didn't really work out like that. So it, I, I – my, my junior year, we were preseason top 25. I started the season at point guard, it eventually made it to the six-man spot, and then kind of like, you know, was our sixth, seventh, eighth man for most of our junior year. Mm -hmm. I learned a valuable lesson that year, and that is to, to not fight your role. Like, what mm -hmm. I want to tell players all the time is like, what, if, if you have a different idea of who you are and your role as the coach, you're not going to win that battle. Like, ultimately, the coach is going gonna, is gonna to play you and, and wants you to do what he wants you to do. And you need to almost graduate. You, like, be the best seventh man you can be, so you got to be the sixth man. And That's then be right. the best sixth man you can be, so you can be the starter. And, then, like, and I felt like that year I learned a valuable lesson in, in humbling myself and not fighting my role. Uh, and then obviously my, my senior year, I, I felt like I, I really, I committed to my body. I really got into great shape um, and ended up starting every game, was a team captain. We went to the NIT, uh, but it was, it, with all that aside, it was great to come home, be in front of, I mean, every, every game I'd have, you know, 10, 15 bars at the game. Mm. And that was fun, you know? Uh, and ultimately I wanted a chance to play and I got that opportunity at Creighton. It was great. See, ladies and gentlemen, that's why I wanted to have Nick on here because he's dropping jewels and gems. If you, I hope you're catching them because I'm, I'm hearing him as he's dropping. <laughs> he's giving some good stuff. Plus, he's got those great pipes. So I wanted you all to hear him. <laughs> uh, so, Nick, t uh, tell us, what, what did you do after you graduated and, and left Creek? Well, so for as long as I can remember, my dream job was what you and I are currently doing with Fox and BT, and I always wanted to be a – a college basketball analyst. Like I never really had, and maybe it was because deep down inside I knew that six two white guys that play above the below the rim don't make it in the NBA. <laughs> I, I never thought about playing in the league. Like I, I was gonna play college basketball, then I was gonna either coach or I was gonna try to go be a college basketball analyst. And mm -hmm. okay. for a year, for a year, I was uh after I graduated, I was a graduate assistant under Dana Altman, and I lucked out where our radio team didn't have a permanent analyst. And so I was able to coach and be Creighton's radio analyst. And they had like a local TV package on the local CBS affiliate where Creighton would pay to be on TV for 10 games. And I got those games. Wow. So I really, really, fresh out of, fresh out of college, Steven, I am coaching. I am doing all the radio games and I'm doing 10 TV Creighton games. Wow. So I'm getting reps. Like I tell people, you just need, you need reps. You know how it is. Like you just, you, there's no substitute for putting on the headset, calling a game, putting on the headset, calling a game. And so right out of that, that was the first year. And then I gravitated into sports talk radio and uh, was, there was a radio station, 1620 The Zone in Omaha that I started to do a show with a guy named Matt Schick, who is now on ESPN as an anchor. Oh, I know Matt, yeah. Yeah, Matt's, yeah. we had the Schick and Nick show for, <laughs> uh, for, for three years, and uh, it was a blast. You know, it was my first taste of sports talk radio. So I'm doing this, the, the talk show, and I'm doing kind of Creighton Radio and Creighton TV, and a huge opportunity for me was – I always tell people no one benefited more from Creighton going to the Big East than me because mm. Creighton going to the Big East brought in FS1, yep. which opened an enormous door for me to be able to do a lot of the Creighton games and then ultimately do a Butler game, do a Xavier game, do maybe a Marquette game. And it just kind of slowly built out from the TV side of things in 20, 
14 or whatever it was the first year of the, of, of the big East. So yeah, it was just, it was, it was coaching. It was radio. It was calling games on the radio and calling local games on TV. So you can tell that Nick is a grinder because in any, in order to have that kind of schedule, coaching is crazy. Coaching is a uh, 25 hours a day, eight days a week. <laughs> and then be able to, to have the presence of mind and jump over to the broadcast booth and do that simultaneously. That's very difficult, ladies and gentlemen. So, Nick, I, I commend you on that, man. I, I'm sitting here listening like, dang, man, this dude, he, you must not have slept much uh, when you first uh, got into it, huh? <laughs> well, it, it is. That, that was honestly one of the things that was eye-opening. Being a coach, like, I realized, oh, the game is, like, the, everybody just sees the games, and they think, like, these dudes are just hanging out, and they show up, and they coach 30 games. Like, no, they're, they're, it's like – the games are like a 5% of what you do year round, whether you're That's on right. the road recruiting, you're at booster events, you're doing different things, whatever. You're making sure a young Stephen Bardo is going to class. So you're making sure a young Nick Baugh understands he's got a test on Tuesday. Like it's a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. And that's why it was really important. I learned so much that one year I was a graduate assistant. I learned a ton about all that goes into being a coach. And then I also was our film coordinator. Wow. And it was, that's where, that was where I really opened my eyes to like, oh, there are a lot of different ways to guard a ball screen. Oh, this team likes to press. This team likes to pack it in. This team hedges ball screens. This team switches everything. Like, it can't, it, like, that was another big year for me. I'd sit and I'd watch these teams and I'm like, man, because you know how it is, like, when you're, you get immersed in what you do. Like, well, th this is how we play. So this is the only way to play. That's and, right you kind of realize the more you watch, the more you learn, the more you don't know. And I felt like that's kind of what was a big, a big deal for me the year I was a coach, was just a totally different lens of seeing things. Uh, so I, I, I always try to, and I'm, I'm sure you do the same, like I try to analyze games from a player's perspective, but every once in a while you do kind of got to put that coaching hat on yeah. and, and try to see things from their vantage point because it's a different vantage point. No, that's a great point. And you know, having you having the back, the basketball background, the coaching background, and now a broadcaster, Nick, you you may, I would I would maybe say you and Jay Billis um, right now in terms of what I'm thinking, you guys may have that that trifecta down, and I'm sure other people have done it, but I don't know very many guys that have the coaching experience along with the broadcast experience and the playing experience, which gives you an incredible pers uh, perspective on the game and, you know, different things because the game is a bunch of patterns. Yep. You can see patterns. You can see things coming. You can forecast. So that, that's outstanding right there, man. Yeah, so I appreciate that. You're, go, you're going along. You're doing a great job at Fox. You're getting Big Ten Network games as well. And you make a decision last summer to go and do your own podcast. Why did you do that? Well, I, it had been – 10 years of doing a, a talk show at the same station. Oh, okay. now, the, Chick the Chick and Nick show lasted for three years, and then it morphed into well, a show that's called Game Time with Nick Bauer. I was doing a solo radio show. Okay. And, you know, I, I felt like there hit a point where, you know, sometimes you need to, you need to kind of force change on yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and, and try to do something different. And I felt like I'd hit that point. Uh, you know, doing a sports talk show in Nebraska, you don't have a pro team, you don't have an NFL team, you don't have an NBA team. So it's, you know, you're talking Nebraska football almost year round. And I love Nebraska football, but, you know, there was a part of me was like, man, I, I don't know if I could do it, you know, keep doing more years of talking a ton of Nebraska football and that's it. Sure. And, and, and so while I'm kind of feeling those emotions, the, the TV side of things with Fox was slowly picking up. And it felt like at some point those two worlds were going to collide and something was going to have to give. Mm -hmm. like, can I give everything that is needed to be a, a great sports talk show host five days a week and also call, you know, 25, 30, 35 basketball games with all the travel and all the prep that goes into that. That's right. And those two, th there was, there was a, a collision coming. And I, I said, I got I to gotta make a decision. And so right about this time, you know, podcasting is slowly starting to emerge and become a viable uh, source of media. In some ways, 
Netflix is to TV what podcasting is to radio. Great you know, like, uh, so I felt like, you know what, 10 years, I feel like I've, I've gained a lot of experience. I can try something new. I can take what I've learned with radio, put my little spin on it with, with my podcast and, and do that. And it was going to free up to be able to really kind of focus in on what was needed to do the college basketball TV games. And I've loved it, Stephen. I've loved doing the podcast. It's, it's given me a, a new source of energy and excitement around what I'm doing. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's kind of what went into that decision. Well, it's a great listen. I've listened to several of the episodes, and you, you sound like you're having a great time and you're getting uh, great people on there. I think uh, Doug Gottlieb, uh, yeah. Dave Billis, you know, you've had some great guests. So I'm happy for you. You know, I'm going to pick your brain on that podcast and see how you do it. <laughs> uh, I okay, love it. So, I love it. Okay, we, we're all trying to grow things. Yeah. Now, I, I want to take you back a couple weeks ago. Where were you when you first heard that all this stuff was canceled? And what were your feelings? So I was in New York for the Big East tournament. That's right. So I was, so for what I do now, like when I'm not, when it doesn't conflict with my TV schedule, I'm still Creighton's radio analyst. So wow. I still, when it doesn't, you know, when there's no conflicts with Fox or BTN, I still travel with Creighton and I'll call games on the radio for them and the NCAA tournament, conference tournaments, all that good stuff. Okay. And so I was in New York and I was going to do radio for Creighton. And on that Wednesday night, that's when everything started to kind of break. The, the Rudy Gobert test positive for coronavirus. There was the image of Fred Hoiberg being sick on the sidelines at the Big Ten tournament. Now, ultimately, he ended up just having the flu, so it was fine. But, like, there was a bunch of stuff happening, and then the NBA season gets canceled. And I don't know about you, but once the NBA season was canceled, I was pretty much convinced, like, there's no way we're finishing the conference tournaments and there's no way we're going to have the NCAA tournament. So what was weird is like, so that Thursday afternoon, the big announcement comes that the NCAA tournament's canceled. And that was, you would think that'd have been like a shock. That was more of like a, well, obviously, you know, right. like it, because of what had happened 24 hours prior to that. Interesting story though, with what happened in between that. So I'm at the playing games, just watching uh, Xavier and DePaul and Georgetown and St. John's. And I get a call from Fox and they, they tell me, Hey, Jim Jackson has some family stuff with this coronavirus thing. He doesn't, he, he can't come to New York. He's got to go back to LA. We need you to step into his place and call some of these biggies tournament games. Oh man. And so I'm like, Oh my God, they're, they're, you know, they're telling me, Hey man, it's going to be you and Gus Johnson for the biggies semifinals and the Big East Finals, and Stephen, like, I almost fell over. I like, bet. I'm at Madison Square Garden by the concessions, and I'm, I'm hearing this news, and I'm like, I'm like fighting back tears, because this is like, I mean, come on, man. Madison Square Garden, Gus That's Johnson, right. Big East, I'm like, this is a dream come true. That's right. But at the same time, you're kind of going, Adam Silver just canceled the NBA season. This isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I ended up coming to the Madison Square Garden the next day, and I called that – I don't know if you remember, Creighton St. John's played. They played one half and then canceled it at halftime. Sure did. I did. And see it. that was – I was on the call for that game with Tim Brando. And so it was so weird where as the ball is getting tipped, we're all kind of looking at each other like, are we seriously playing this game? And you kept on waiting for Val Ackerman or someone to run onto the court and be like, we're done. We're not – we're done with this. And so ultimately they, they canceled it at, at halftime. But – you know, and then and then all of a sudden that everything in a 24 hour span was like, whoa, this is this is this is scary stuff. Like mm -hmm. this is this went from like, oh, this who knows what is this coronavirus thing to like, this is a huge event in everybody's lifetime. Yes. Well, I, man, Nick, I you know I wish you would have gotten those opportunities, man, because I know uh, you know people in our business like me would give a body part to be oh. in the semifinals and the finals of a Big East conference tournament. I mean, it's, it's probably the best one in college basketball historically. No I would doubt. Say. Would you no agree doubt. with that? I would. I mean, it, MSG on Saturday night, Big East Finals, I mean, it doesn't – I mean, I get goosebumps just saying it. Like, it is – it's different. The Garden's different. The, bit, the Big East is different. And, I, you know, Gus and his style, and I just I – I'd have been – I'd have been smiling ear to ear the whole time. And so – 
you know, it was, it was just so weird during that time to like get that news, but then in the back of your mind, know that it's not really going to happen mm. because eventually this stuff's going to get canceled. But man, it was, uh, I don't know how it was for you. I couldn't, I, obviously we all know there are bigger things happening right now and there, and basketball is a small part of all this, but like, I do really, my heart goes out to a lot of these seniors Yes. who the rugs pulled out from under them. I, w I told this story that I remember, now I don't know, you might've been a, more of a man than me, Steven, but the hardest I ever cried after a basketball game was my senior year, mm. Missouri Valley Conference Tournament. We lost in the semifinals to Drake and we obviously knew we weren't going to get an at-large bid. We had to go win the conference tournament to get into the NCAA tournament. Okay. And when we lost that game, that was like you knew that was it. Like, I'm a senior. I'm not going to the NCAA tournament. Now, we ultimately went to the NIT, but all the all the, the sprints and the conditioning and the jump shots in the summer, you just are picturing yourself in the NCAA tournament. Yep. And so I just know how it felt when I got back to the locker room knowing that it was over. I was not going to play in the NCAA tournament, but at least I had a chance to control it. Like I laced him up and I went and competed and I lost. Great like point. that was on me. Yep. But for Peyton Pritchard and Miles Powell and Marcus Howard and Cassius Winston and all these dudes, I just couldn't imagine the rug getting pulled out for, from under you and it's taken away from you and you didn't even have a chance to lace him up and go control your own destiny. Like I do feel really, really bad for those guys. Yeah, that's well said, Nick. I, it's such – it's such, to try to show or explain to viewers what it's like, it's so abrupt that we, we're creatures of habit, especially basketball players. We, we practice, we eat, we do these routines, and all of a sudden you wake up the next day, you don't have anywhere to go, you don't have anywhere to be, you know, you don't know where your teammates are, your, your routine is off. And like you said, the, the, the end of your career for a lot of people – is that is that last game of that of their senior year in college? And so, yeah. you know, you, that was uh, very well said. Um, I feel especially bad, Nick, for the Creighton program. The first time they're able to get a Big East title, and with that team, the way they were playing, I know they hit a rough spot there in one of the last regular season games or something like that. But they won a share of the Big East title. I thought defensively, I covered. Uh, Creighton had Marquette. They took Marquette out of everything they wanted to do defensively. I've not seen a McDermott team play defense like that. I thought Creighton had a great shot of advancing deep in the tournament. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, yeah, th that was also added a layer of frustration to all this is Creighton's having arguably the best season in program history. I mean, it is th – they finished the season ranked seventh. By a lot of bracketologists, they were maybe going to be a two seed. Wow. And, and so, you know, they, they were having an unbelievable season. Yes, they and were. I do think – I'm totally with you. that Creighton's never been confused for the bad boy Pistons or anything like that. <laughs> They've been a team that wants to outscore you. But they had a little bit more grit and toughness to them this year, which we all know they can score. You know they can shoot. You know those three guards are out of this world good. And – Coach McDermott did such a good job of masking and, and the fact that they had really didn't have any size and playing a certain way to make their weakness, their strength. Uh, I do think the, the one thing that Creighton fans that makes this whole pill easier to swallow is, number one, Marcus Zagorowski hurt his knee on, at, on the last game of the season and hurt his meniscus. Who knows if he would have been able to come back, and I don't think he would have been 100%. Right. So you don't know if if with the healthy Marcus Zagorowski, I thought Creighton was like Final Four level type of team. I agree. But if if Zagorowski wasn't fully healthy, I don't know about that. Right. And then the other thing is Creighton returns everybody. So it's not like I mean they return the only guys they lose are Kelvin Jones, who was a six eleven, you know, like eighth man off the bench. But other than that, they have new draw coming back. So. At least they feel like – that doesn't make it any – necessarily sting any less, but at least they feel like, okay, Zegarowski was banged up and we, we get to run it back with everybody the next this next season. So they're going to get a chance to go, hopefully, see what they can do with this group. But, 
Yeah, I, I don't – I was blown away at the season Creighton had. And, uh, and, and I know for me, like, being around the program, I've been around – you know, when I transferred, it was 2005. So I feel like I've, I've been around the program intimately for 15 years. To me, this was even, you know, even better than Doug McDermott's senior year team. Mm -hmm. Like, th this team to me was the best Creighton team I've ever seen. And uh, I, I'm trying to be optimistic and just say, hey, man, next year is going to be really, really fun. There you go. There you go. You know what, Nick? I, I got to – I come to, you know, come to Omaha a lot because – Sometimes we'll fly in Omaha and drive over to Lincoln when we're covering Nebraska games. And I've done a ton of Creighton games over the years. I really like the city of Omaha. It's an underrated market. The guys at ESPN when I used to work there said the best event of the year was the College Baseball World Series. Yeah. I mean, can, can you describe uh, what it's like out there in Omaha for the College Baseball World Series? It's crazy. I mean, because it's a two-week-long event. It's not like just a weekend or a day. It's a two-week celebration of everything with the city. You know, the you know the Drover is the famous steakhouse. There was a you know a famous bar, Polly's, that everybody would go to. And the Omaha is an event town. And you know, whether it's a concert, the swim trials, the NCAA tournament, whatever, they really rally around those things. And so the College World Series has become really a fabric in the Omaha culture, you know, and, and every single year, everybody, you know, takes work off. Everybody at least takes a few days to go down and tailgate or, you know, go, go get some tickets and sit in the outfield or sit on the third baseline or whatever, drink a beer, eat a hot dog, take in a baseball game. There's kind of something real American and uh, about that, you know, like really? sitting there on a hot summer day, you know, in the stands and just watching a baseball game. And so, yeah, it's a, you're right. Like Omaha is, all I can, all I can tell you is hosting different recruits when they would come on visits to Creighton. You'd get some guys that, you know, they would, every one of them would be like, man, yep. I thought I was going to come to a cornfield with a <laughs> barn in it. You know, like, like we were going to ride horses to our English class and then ride another, you know, like I think people have this image of, of Omaha, Nebraska as being just this farm town. Yep. And it's not like that at all. Now, it's not Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, but it's not, you know, uh, it's, it's not uh, – you're not going to class in a barn either, you know. And I, I think uh, to a man, that, that's what – you know, you talk to Greg McDermott or, or Dana Altman, their big thing was like, we just got to get guys on campus yep. to see it, you know, because there's so many people that, that – listen, I mean, Nebraska's – you know, I mean, they're – the corn state, you know, like not saying there isn't farms there, but there's some connotations with that that aren't necessarily true. But when guys get on campus, they see the city. And as you know, when they see the CHI health center now was the quest center. It was yeah, like, I remember when, so when I was transferring, that was right when the arena was opening. And I remember coach Altman took me on the visit and I was like, you guys play. I mean, I loved Allen Fieldhouse, but this was like an enormous bill. I'm like, you guys play here. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, you guys get 16, 17,000 here? It's like, yeah, you know? And so there's a lot. Omaha is an underrated city for uh, – and I, I think everybody should come out, whether it's College World Series or go see a Creighton game. No, I agree. And uh, I'm also going to say, Nick, that I'm so happy that the Omaha airport did something with that walk to the rental car. Yeah. Uh, bruh. That was – hey, man, that, look, that was like God throwing machetes <laughs> at you coming through that <laughs> Am I wrong? No. Oh, I've not been so cold in my life. Come I don't know. Who, who set that up? Who? What were they thinking putting the rental car place so far away so people don't know you had to walk out, like a long ways yep. outside? Yep. And obviously, especially when you're traveling there, it's winter, it's December, it's yep. January, it's freezing out there. I don't know what they were thinking. They got a nice new one now where you stay inside that's, that's fantastic. Maybe that's like there's – you can't have it all because like – I'm always – like, if you come into Omaha, first of all, the airport is five minutes away from your hotel. Which and the hotel, oh, the hotel is connected to the arena. That's so, right. So, like, it's, it's, a, it's a traveler's dream without it is. But I guess maybe to make you earn that, you got to walk, like, 15 minutes in zero-degree weather before you get all the other stuff. Oh, well said, man. Nick, where can people find you on your social media platforms and, and find your podcast? Yeah, so uh, – 
anywhere you, you can download podcasts, it's the Nick Bob Podcast, B-A-H-E, the Nick Bob Podcast. Just click that subscribe button. I tweet out all my podcasts. I have all my information on my Twitter, uh, at Nick Bob, N-I-C-K-B-A-H-E. Uh, you know, we talk a lot of different things, man. We talk a little bit of college basketball, uh, a little bit of college football. We talk a little bit of life. I, I have one of my best friends who played football at Nebraska and was with the Patriots for a little bit. We have something called the Wine Podcast, where we get a bottle of wine. We don't finish the podcast, even until that bottle of wine is gone. Wow. We, did, we just try to have fun and uh, give you a little bit of entertainment. And I'm glad you're doing something like this, too, because the world needs you branching out and the world needs as much entertainment as we can get right now because we're all sitting in our house quarantine losing our minds so i am a fan that you're doing this and so people can check out what you're doing and what i'm doing. well I, I appreciate that nick man and uh i once all this uh virus thing settles down a little bit depending on when they do it if they do it with the college world series i'm coming out there so we, we're going to, I don't know if we'll finish a whole bottle of wine, but let's get a couple <laughs> beers and make sure we have. <laughs> hey, I'm going to get you the best steak you've ever had in your life. And we will have, we will drink some beer. We'll, I, I'll, I'll take care of you. Just don't okay. worry about it. We need this coronavirus stuff to hopefully come and go. And then you need to get out to Omaha and I'll treat you right. All right. I, I'm going to hold you to that, man. <laughs> Nick Bob, thank you so much for joining this edition of Bartles Breakdown. Make sure you come to the page. Every day we'll have an interview like this or we'll go live and we will get through this uh, shelter in coronavirus situation together. Make sure you're doing the safety protocols, washing your hands, social distancing, and we'll get through it. So until next time, guys, peace.